All right, AP Psych, what's up? Welcome back. We're on to our next set of video notes here. Now we're going to start really digging into the research part of our research methods unit um, with our first part, descriptive research methods. This is an important one. Um, one of our FRQs on the AP test, the AAQ, we'll talk about that in a little bit, is going to be specifically about descriptive research methods or experimental research. So we want to lock in on this one. Make sure you take some good notes and identify these different research methods that we're going to talk about and how psychologists ask and answer questions in their day-to-day -day research. So let's go. So first up, we're going to talk about correlation and correlational studies. So the measure of the relationship between two items or variables, that's a correlational study. You're trying to determine is variable A connected to variable B, is variable B linked to variable C, whatever it is you're studying, you're trying to show a link between or find out if there is a link between two variables. So there's two types of correlation. There's positive correlation, and in a positive correlation you have two variables that increase together or decrease together. Right? The variables move together, whatever direction they're going. That is what a positive correlation is. They move together. Okay? So an example of that would be the more, you, uh, the more time you spend running on a treadmill, the more calories you'll burn. Right? So as that time on treadmill increases, the amount of calories you're burning also increases. So it's positively correlated because the two are moving together. On the flip side, negative correlation is going to be the opposite of that. Right? Variables move in opposite directions. So if, here's an example for you, the miles you travel, right? As you travel more miles, that's going to be negatively correlated with the amount of gas, right, that you have left in your tank. So those two variables are moving in opposite directions. More miles, less gas. Right? That's a negative correlation. So if you're in AP stats or a statistics class, you'll be, get intimately familiar with correlation. And um, I'm sure you'll be able to tell me some even more complex things about it. But that's the basics behind correlation. We're talking positive or negative correlation. And we'll look at some examples here to get us through. So when a correlational study is being described or shown, in research outcomes, you're going to see a scatter plot most often. So we got to get used to looking at scatter plots. Um, the correlation, there's something called correlational coefficient, which I'll show you on the next slide, but it's always either between a positive one and a negative one, right? That is where correlational numbers fall. A perfect positive correlation is one, right? And that would be a straight line of all your data right here. It's perfect positive correlation. Perfect negative is the exact opposite goes down from left to right instead of up from left to right. If there was no relationship between variables, there's no correlation here, there's no link, that would be zero, right? And that's your no relationship. So a scatter plot is just a graph comprised of all the points generated by your research of these two variables. And the slope of those points depicts the direction and the amount uh, of scatter, the strength of the relationship. So we'll see a couple examples here to show you different strength values in a correlational relationship. So first up, correlational coefficient. So you might see you might see a question about, hey, what's the R value or the correlational coefficient tell us in this research study, right? In an AQ or something like that. Well, that's the statistical measure that shows the degree of relationship between the two variables. So your correlational coefficient or R value in this example is 0.37, positive 0.37. That just indicates the direction of the relationship, right? That tells us that it's a positive 0.37, which is a, a moderate to relatively weak positive correlation, right? So you have this is going to be plus or minus, indicating the direction, positive or negative, and your number is going to in indicate the strength. The closer to 1 and negative 1, the stronger the relationship. The closer to 0, the weaker the correlation or the weaker the relationship. Those numbers are always going to fall between negative 1 and positive 1, right? So let's look at some examples. As we go through this, I'll pull them up. Feel free to pause. And before I tell you, you know, you could, you could think about it in your own mind, what kind of a relationship do the following correlations have? Negative 0.78, what's that going to be? That's going to be a more strongly positive, or excuse me, negative, a relatively strong negative correlation positive 0.05, that's a very, very weak, almost no correlation, very weak positive correlation. Negative 0.03, a moderate negative correlation. And positive 0.92, that's a very, very strong positive correlation. 
So let's look at what those might look like on a scatter plot. So negative 0.78. Visualize that in your mind, which direction it's going to be going, right down from left to right. And you can see the scatter here of the results of the study. A little bit more spaced out, but still relatively strong negative correlation. Positive 0.05. Think about what that should look like. That's going to look like your, uh, your data points are kind of all over the place with a very weak upslope, right? Relatively weak positive correlation. 0.43, same thing, spread out still a little bit, a little bit more than the 0.78, but still a, a decently moderate negative correlation. And then this one should be pretty strong left to right. There you go. So those are just some different um, scatter plots to match them up with the uh, the different correlational coefficients or R values. We'll do some work in class to, to practice those in some real world scenarios too. So another example, real world scenario, a scatter plot showing the rela relationship between height and temperament in people. What kind of a relationship is depicted? Well first we got to remember what temperament is. Temperament is, is kind of like people's emotional stability in a way, you know, are they are they calm, relaxed, a little more fiery, quick to anger, um, you know, do they have a short fuse, that type of thing. So what is this Scatter plot telling us. Well, this seems to be claiming that there's a correlation between height and temperament scores. So people who are taller tend to score higher on temperament in terms of being a little bit more relaxed, go with the flow, which I'm pretty tall. I think I agree with that, right? Um, I think, like to think I'm pretty relaxed, laid back, but I'm sure there's some of you out there who may be a little bit more vertically challenged who would also say, hey, I'm, I'm pretty chill too, you know? So this shows a pretty moder moderately positive um, correlation. They seem to move together. But can we trust it? Right? When we talk about correlation and correlational studies, there's always one thing we have to keep in mind, and that is correlation does not mean causation. We cannot claim that taller people have, just because you're taller, you're going to be more, or have a higher temperament score. You're going to be more relaxed. You're going to be more laid back. You're going to be more calm. We don't know that. right? There could be a third variable in there. Um, confounding our, our results. Another thing, men who have been married for 50 years are often bald. So does being married cause you to go bald? Great question. I don't know, I mean, I guess technically I went bald after I got married, but I sure as heck haven't been married for 50 years, right? Maybe there's some third variables in there like age, genetics, things like that that are you know, causing this link between these two variables. So knowing that two items are correlated does not necessarily tell us why or exactly how they're correlated. We have got to keep that in mind every time. So here's some some potential issues or reasons why correlation is not causation. The first is the directionality problem, right? Does variable A cause variable B or does variable B cause variable A, right? Does being married for 50 years cause you to go bald or does being bald cause you to be married for 50 years? I don't know, we have a directionality problem there. We don't know which way the relationship goes or which variable is impacting the other. Um, so for example, low self-esteem could cause depression or depression could cause low self-esteem, right? Could go either way. The second issue is the third variable problem, which we mentioned a little bit, right? Although both factors are related, they both are caused by another often unidentified factor. So in this situation, low self-esteem and depression, while they are linked, there seems to be some type of connection. They could be caused by distressing events or a biological predisposition, right? So we just know that there's a link. We don't know why, and we don't know what's causing it. So correlational studies provide us with more information, but they're not causal in that sense. And the third variable could impact both variables in the correlation. Right. All right. So. A reminder of this, we see this in the classroom, there's a sign there, correlation does not mean causation. They might try to trip you up with something like that, a question on the AP test where they present you with a correlational study and they ask you to identify the cause and effect relationship here. Well, you gotta know, hey, that's a correlational study. There's no elements of an experiment. There's no control group. There's no random assignment. There's no random selection and all of those things that are necessary in an experiment that we'll talk about in your next set of notes. So our second type of descriptive research method is a naturalistic observation. So this is an observation of human or animal behavior in the environment in which it typically occurs. Right? One of the most famous being Jane Goodall's study of chimpanzee culture where she was able to 
observe them in their natural environment and learn a heck of a lot about um, chimpanzee culture, primate interaction, and how they behave out in the real world. So why might we use that for humans? Well, it's valuable where other methods are likely to be disruptive or misleading, right? If you're trying to just see someone or something in its natural environment and, and gather data and describe what their day-to-day -day life is like, a naturalistic observation is a great option, okay? But there are obviously some problems with this. If people know they're being observed, they tend to act differently than they normally would. That's called the Hawthorne effect, right? That's something to maybe highlight. Um, but think about that, right? If you know you're being watched, you're going to act differently, right? I mean, if I'm like out for a run, and I know some people are watching me for some reason, I feel myself like speeding up because I want to look good, right? Or maybe you're in class and you're a little bored, who knows? Or you see a Snapchat icon pop up and you're like, you pull it up and you're like, oh, perfect. Let me, uh, let me snap back. Let me send a picture of the, of the ceiling to keep my streak going, something like that. But then your teacher walks over. Oh, you put that thing away real quick and you're like, no, I was doing what I was supposed to, right? When you know you're being watched, your behavior changes. So that's one issue with naturalistic observation. Ethically speaking, you have to tell people you're observing them. So how do we combat the Hawthorne effect? Well, you observe them for a long period of time. Think about uh, um, reality television, right? They know they're being watched. They know there's cameras everywhere but they're gonna be in that house together for the next three months, right? Eventually, the feeling of being watched wears off and you start to behave like you normally would, right? So if you're gonna do a natural, naturalistic observation, the best way is to do it for a long period of time. And observations can be distorted if observers expect to see certain behaviors. This is what we call researcher bias. So you have to be sure that as a, as a scientist, as a, a psychologist, as a researcher, that you are taking all your biases and you're setting them aside and you're saying, I'm just going to observe and record what I see here. I'm not expecting to see anything. I'm just gonna record this information and describe in this descriptive research method. So that's naturalistic observation. Then we have case study. This is an intensive examination of the behavior and mental processes associated with a specific person, situation, or it can be a group of people, right? There can be a group case study. One of the most famous examples is this man right here, Phineas Gage, if you've ever heard of him. He was a railroad worker. He was tamping down some dynamite with this tamping rod right here when it set the dynamite off and it exploded and shot that tamping rod up through the bottom of his chin, out the top of his face and head, right? And it took a big old chunk of his frontal lobe of his brain out. Luckily, somehow, miraculously, he didn't die, but he lost a big chunk of his brain. And it was a great way um, for the psychological and scientific community to understand a little bit more about the brain. And his personality changed, and his temperament changed, and suddenly people were realizing, oh, I guess different parts of the brain are responsible for different things, right? And the frontal lobe is responsible for your personality, your organization, your temperament, and things like that, which, thanks to Phineas Gage, people became a little bit more interested in the different brain structures and their responsibilities. So these are super useful when something is new, complex, or fairly rare, right? You wanna dive deeply into something and get a lot of specific information about something that's new, something that's complex that we need to understand better, or something that's rare and we don't have a chance to study it very often, then this is a great opportunity to do that. It's often used in clinical work um, in hospitals and in neuropsychology to better understand the brain because the brain is so complex. Uh, there are some limitations to case studies generalizability. If you're only looking at one specific person or a group of people, you cannot then take that and apply it to the larger population because you don't have a representative sample like you would in an experiment. So you can't really generalize it. And it's tough to replicate uh, because if things are new, complex, or fairly rare, you're not going to have the opportunity to replicate them like you would other studies. And they're unlikely to be representative, and that comes back to generalizability. If it's not representative of the larger population, then it's tough to say, hey, this applies to other people. It's really just gaining information about specific instances that we need to know more about. So with that being said, though, they do provide valuable material for further research and serve as a testing ground for new treatments, specifically drugs, cancer research, things like that, uh, or training programs and other applicable research scenarios where we need to start with a very specific case 
and then maybe we can start to think about, hey, this seems to be working with one or two or three of these case studies. Can we start to roll it out after that if you can replicate it? But case studies are very useful for, for gaining detailed information about specific or complex topics. And then our next is something called a meta-analysis. Okay, so a meta-analysis is a type of research that combines the results of multiple studies on the same topic to draw a broader conclusion. You're not doing any new research in a meta-analysis. You're looking at all of the relevant research on a topic, you're analyzing it, and you're coming together to say, based on the relevant research studies, this is my conclusion. Right? Think of it like kind of gathering puzzle pieces uh, from each study and putting them together to see the bigger picture. Right? When there's, these, are, these are used when there's already a, a breadth of research on a topic, right? That might be that might be breast cancer or the impacts of antidepressants on a depressed person's brain chemistry, things like that. When there's been a lot of studies done, you don't really need to do more studies. We just need to understand those studies better and what they're telling us. So this helps researchers understand those overall trends, see if results are consistent, and identify patterns that individual studies might miss, right? When we put all of the studies we've done together, we can start to see how, um, how they come together and, and tell the story of, you know, does this drug work? Does this treatment work? Things like that. It's a powerful tool to get a clearer and more reliable answer to a research question. Okay? And one thing I want you to add here in your notes is something called effect size. So in a meta-analysis, let's say you're looking at a cancer drug, right, for, for liver cancer or something like that, and you have three studies with different techniques. You're trying to figure out, hey, what's the best technique to treat liver cancer? And all of these studies are statistically significant, which means the treatment is effective, right? The treatment works, right? Well, then how do you decide which of the three treatments to go with? Well, with effect size, this will tell you how effective the treatment is, right? The treatment might be statistically significant, which we'll learn a little bit more about in stats, meaning that the treatment does work, but certain treatments are more effective than others. And that's where effect size comes into play, right? So we determine that, hey, based on these, the meta-analysis I did, I found these three treatments that really work, but study number one and the treatment that it tried has a much larger effect size, meaning it is going to treat liver cancer much more effectively than study two and three, even though maybe their techniques still worked and were statistically significant, right? So effect size is something that we'll use in, in statistics and meta-analysis to, to determine like, hey, what is the most useful of these useful tools? Or how effective is this tool, right? That's effect size in a sense. Okay, so those were four types of descriptive research that we just talked about. We are going to go over experimental research in the next video, but you're going to be asked to identify one of these types of research methods in part A of the AAQ on the AP test. Okay, so they're going to give you an article, a research study, condensed research study. You're going to read it, and part A is always going to be, hey, what type of research method is this? And you're going to need to be able to identify that was a correlational study. No, that was a natural, naturalistic observation. I think it was a case study. Well, it seems like a meta-analysis. Or if there's control groups and random assignment and random selection, that's an experiment. Okay? So just be prepared for that. Make a note of that. And that's what makes these descriptive research methods so important for the AP test because you know you're going to be quizzed specifically on this on the AAQ. So just a couple other tools um, to wrap up that are important for research but that are not types, I would say, or, or relevant types for us of research methods, right? Those five we just looked at are the most important, but you may see some references to these things, so it's good to know a little bit about them. First up is a quasi-experiment, and this is a, studies, a study that have the same control as experiments, yet do not include the random assignment of participants. So if you don't have random assignment, you cannot imply cause and effect. Okay? Where might this situation come about? Well. Let's say you have a, a sample of people that you want to study, but it's not ethical to put people in this certain situation, right? You just need to find people who maybe are already in this situation. So for example, researchers want to test the hypothesis that a pregnant woman's use of drugs will cause abnormalities in her developing baby. It is not ethical to have a control group of pregnant women and then a experimental group of women that you assign to take drugs while they're pregnant, right? You could never get away, get away with that. You could never do that. You'd never want to do that. Um, so 
that's what a quasi experiment is. We're not going to have a random representative sample because we're looking at a specific group of people in a very specific situation that we cannot recreate or reproduce either ethically or just in general, right? So that is a quasi experiment, right? You could could you ethically randomly assign women who are 8 weeks pregnant to a group that will be smoking cigarettes 3 times a day? No. But you can gain a lot of information from analyzing that group and seeing the effects of that situation on them. Okay? So conclusions are not as firm as drawn from true experiments, yet they do allow the research to be conducted on topics and in settings that would otherwise be impossible. So if you saw something like this, and you're like, hey, there's no random assignment, right, and the sample's not representative, it's still an experiment. You just can't really claim cause and effect anymore because you don't have that random selection and random assignment that's needed for that. And our last thing is, is a survey. We're all familiar with surveys. We know what surveys are about. They're a technique for ascertaining self-reported attitudes, opinions, or behaviors of people, usually by questioning a representative random sample of people. So a lot of times um, a method of gathering information or um, in an experimental group to, to gather attitudes or impacts of, of the treatment, they might use a survey. Right? But surveys could also be used in in case studies, they could also be used in correlational studies. So surveys are pretty are a pretty um, versatile tool that researchers have to get, gather information from people. So the validity of survey data has a few caveats, though, right? It depends on how questions are worded. So if you think about surveys, you can word the questions, and the researchers can manipulate their questions to get the answers they want. So you have to be careful to make sure you're not having any bias in the way your questions are worded. We'll look at one example in class that's kind of funny. Um, but also, if you think about the way questions are worded and how they impact your everyday life, think about when you go to the grocery, when you're going to go pick up some, maybe some ground beef, right? And on one ground beef package, it says, like, you know, 90% fat-free. Like, oh, that sounds pretty good, 90%, 95%, great. Imagine if those, question, if those words were flipped and you walked up to the ground beef and it said 10% fat. I mean, that's automatically like, oh, 10% fat. I don't want that, that's a lot of fat, right? So how we word things, very important to the validity of survey data and can manipulate people's responses. The representativeness of people surveyed, why would that matter? If you're only sending out survey data to a certain group of people and it's not representative of the larger population, then you're not getting a good um, coverage of all the demographics, right? And you're going to get skewed results. Right? Think about that in politics. People are always claiming, you know, you know, candidate A is leading candidate B in the latest polls and things like that. And then if you dig deeper into their survey data, well, maybe they're only polling people in certain areas of the country or in certain states that lean one way or the other. Or maybe the candidate only sent out the survey to people who are on their email list, which are people who are going to sign up and who are interested in that candidate, right? So you have to have a representative sample on a survey for it to be legitimate and valid. A few other limitations, the willingness of people to honestly complete the survey. We're gonna see how honestly you guys completed that fear survey that we took at the beginning of, of class last week. Um, you get a chance to prove if you're being honest or not. We'll see what that looks like. And people may say what they believe should they should say about an issue. When you know there's hot button topics and somebody else is going to read your response, you might not actually respond the way that you truly believe. And you might say something that you think they want to hear. Right? So you need, you need anonymous surveys, you need representativeness, you've got to be quite careful how your questions are worded so that people feel like they can truly be honest in their responses and they're not going to be judged for it. Right? Still, a survey is a great way to gather large amounts of information, probably the best way we have. Um, and it's a great technique to attach to another research method to get the information that you need um, in your endeavors. So those are our descriptive research methods. Very important for the AP test and for the AAQ. We'll get into the experimental method in your next notes, which is also gonna be important. Um, and we'll be breaking that down and then wrapping things up at the end of the unit with statistics. As always, if you got any questions, let us know in class, um, and we'll see you then.